You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. Welcome to The Grape Nation, your weekly wine journey. Our guest is John Fine. We'll talk to John about wine, wine online, the new wine review, and more. I asked John to bring a bottle in, so we'll taste that during the show and talk about it on the weekly wine sip. I'm your host, Sam Ben Ruby. Stay with us for The Grape Nation on the Heritage Radio Network. We bring wine to the people. John Fine is the editor-in-chief of The New Wine Review. He's an award-winning writer, including a James Beard, and served as executive acting editor-in-chief of Inc. Magazine, along with stints at Business Week, Vanity Fair, GQ, Food and Wine, among others. He has also documented his life as a musician in his book, Your Band Sucks, The New Wine Review, is a next generation wine publication and has set out with the goal of making it the most interesting place on the internet for people who love wine. And we're going to ask John to make that case. John, welcome to the Grape Nation. Sam, it's great to be here. We are talking to John face to face live at the Heritage Radio Network studios at Roberta's Pizza in Bushwick, Brooklyn. So it's nice to be uh, in person with John. So, John, where'd you grow up? Uh, I was born in Wichita Falls, Texas, but uh, I grew up in suburban New Jersey. I drop in the Wichita Falls, Texas thing, so I don't scan for every other Jewish-looking dude in New York City. <laughs> when did you come from Texas to Jersey? I was four months old. At the oh, time. You're, you're a little kid. Hey, man, the birth certificate and the passport says Wichita Falls, Texas. I rest my case. It does. You know, I... I I lived in Jersey for years, and my kids kind of hate that, but all of them were born in Princeton. So when people say, where were you born, they don't say Jersey. They say Princeton. I, I, you I would do the same. I understand that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand yeah. that. Um, so you attended Oberlin College. I'm trying to tie things together later on. What did you study there? I had to think for a minute. Um, I majored in something called American history um, because what, what it boiled down to was uh, – I went there for writing. Um, I knew I wanted to write. I, for reasons not going into, I did not love the creative writing department. I was, what's the term I'm looking for here? A shitty student. I was not really engaged in academics. I was very- Not, in, a, not a dumb student, a shitty student. You didn't apply yourself or you were disinterested. I was disinterested. I decided pretty early in my college career that if a class was before 11 in the morning that I wasn't going to take it. Um, I spent a great deal of time. It's a good criteria. It's, it, it was a very good criteria. I, it, it also I, missed I only did Tuesday through Thursday classes. I tried to do that. It didn't work all the time. It didn't work. So what I would do instead was like, you know, Thursday night I'd stay out late. There, there was a disco, um, which was a kind of a locus of uh, act, like social activity there. And I had a Thursday night disco show and I was in a band and we'd often play Friday night. So starting Thursday night, I would just pretty much stop. Like I just wouldn't go to class on Friday. I, I spent a great deal of time at the radio station, WOBC, and um, playing in my punk rock band. All right. So before we get into talking about wine and the new wine review, it's fair to say that a big chunk of your life, probably the first half, most of your young adult life into your adult life, involve music. So let's not spend the whole show on it because we could talk about the band and music and all the crap that wraps around it. Um, but, and, and it led to a book, a memoir, your band sucks. So let me launch this in certain different ways. Did you play guitar as a kid? I started out playing piano. Um, piano pi lessons from the parents? Piano like lessons. John, sit here and take... No, it was more, there was a piano in the house. And from a very young age, I was getting into music. And um, because 
I was short because I had something of a big personality and because I wore glasses. <laughs> um, and it was the 70s. Elton John was the obvious model. I mean, I'm, we're talking like when I'm six or seven here. And um, at some point I was like, you know, I, I want to start doing this. So I, I took piano lessons. Uh, didn't really take. I mean, I did it for like five years. But um, the piano teacher died, which was a problem. And um, I had nothing to do with it, though. Uh, I I really had nothing to do with you that. You didn't like, I had pull the seat or I anything? I did not. I had no. Uh, okay. Um, I, did I'm, anybody ever investigate that? Um, they can. He, he was a lovely guy, Ed okay. Novi. Um, like, um, he, he was lovely, um, but he unfortunately passed away and uh, didn't play music for a while. And then I just went up to my parents and asked them if I could get an electric guitar. And they were like, well, yeah, that's a bit of an investment. How about we start you out on a really shitty acoustic guitar to see if you actually like this? And uh, I stuck with it. This is like 12, 13, 11, 14. I want to say, well, I got an electric guitar for my bar mitzvah. Okay, so 13. 13. But I had this, so I probably 11 or 12 uh, for guitar lessons. Yeah. Did did the acoustic distract you for a moment because you wanted electric or it worked as a good segue? I really wanted the electric. Like, so I you really made the, wanted the electric. I, that's what I thought. Yeah, they, 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 there was some motivation there. And I was just interested. Um, it got much more dimensional once you start playing with um, electricity and distortion and volume. Uh, it, Which it was much important more to the type of music you were playing. So you take to that, you enjoy it. I mean, fingerboards playing or well um there was a i was how to put this um punk rock was happening this is the early 80s okay but i may as i write about this in my book your band sucks but um you know i may as well have been on mars to learn about punk rock or the interesting music that was happening in new york which was 30 miles from my hometown um, what do you mean? You were oblivious? Oh, to- it, it, it did not translate at all to suburban New Jersey. Well, I mean, like, it was on the let's radio. Go back. It was not on the radio. Press it, didn't cover it heavily. Press did not cover it heavily. Um, there were there was no internet. Children, it, we, we got by without it. Um, MTV did not touch this stuff no. at all, at all. I mean, it, it was completely invisible. And you know, you, you would see these little hints in the media, like there, there was a band called the New York Dolls, and they were kind of interesting ten years ago. And you would spend three years looking for that record and find it. Um, uh, in Jersey. I mean, this is pretty common if you weren't in a big city. You had to find the people who could get yeah. you hooked on to the stuff. It was not unlike, you know, trying to buy cocaine or something. Like, you, right. you had to hang out with a weird guy in the mom's basement who lived in his mom's basement who didn't really have a job and maybe he would play a cool <laughs> record. Um, you know, and, and I mean, I'm, I'm going to try to compress this. Like, in time you find that... Um, my guitar lessons weren't particularly good. They didn't really teach me what I needed to do. And I was futzing around on guitar with people, people in high school. But it wasn't until I got to Oberlin where there was an actual punk rock band playing there. And it made it clear that this is a thing you can do. You don't have to be Bruce Springsteen. So that's the important launching point I want to take. Switch from piano to guitar, acoustic to electric, futzed around, went to college. Good awakening there for guitar. Give me, and like I said, we can't spend the whole show on this, even though we could. Give me sort of that chronological ascension of you, the guitar, the effect of Oberlin, the band, you know, talk to me specifically about Bitch Magnet, you know, give me best as you can. How much time you got, Sam? Well, but, but that, that's my point. I mean, you, you have to, somebody will come in and say, John, this is a 2,000 word piece. You need to knock it down to 700. You know what to do. Do it. Well, uh, thank you for that vote of confidence. Okay. Um, it is a matter of finding the community that understands you. The, 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 this was an important thing if you were a misfit suburban kid in the uh, in, in the 1980s. You know, you Did grew- you know to look for it or it kind of was there and you found it? I did not know it was there. Um, I left my high school thinking that I was generally going to be around people who disliked me and were hostile for me, to me for reasons I didn't understand. And like that, high school was a little. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I will not forgive my high school. <laughs> I'm, I'm just not doing that. I don't blame you. Yeah. Let's see. You understand. Um, uh, so it comes with finding the community. It comes with seeing people that are doing like music that succeeds as music, you know, that are people that you see on campus around town. Like, you don't have to be Bruce Springsteen to do it. You find a couple of people to play music with. Hopefully it goes well. I was very lucky in that. The first band I played with, there was a bassist uh, named Soo Young Park who could really write songs. 
um, as well as being like kind of a punk rock head. And very quickly, we ended up with a drummer named Orestes De La Tour, now Orestes Morphine. He took his father's name. Um, uh, who is, and those who know his drumming, no, I'm not lying when I say this, one of the greatest drummers in the world, period. I still I still play with him, by the way. I mean, he, he and I have a band called We Contain Multitudes, and we just made a record um, in October of last year. What's it called? The band is We Contain Multitudes. We Contain Multitudes. Yes, we don't have social we can Multitudes. No, no, I, we I, contain I multitudes. talk too fast. And um, where do we find that? Bandcamp or something? Um, eventually, yes. I'm, okay. I don't want to get into the details here. I'm, I'm right, so I'm, we'll, I mean, I'm talking with a label a little shelf bit. Shelf Yeah. Um, but, you know, like... It's it, amazing how randomly you kind of stumble and hook up with these guys. It was an enormous, significant. It was an enormous stroke of fortune because yeah. I had no idea what the fuck I was doing, like none whatsoever. Uh, but by playing with better people is how you get good. And I mean, I trailed those guys for years and years and years, but you know, got good enough. Um, and good enough was plenty good. All right. So you meet these guys. Don't you? Is there a band? Is the band Bitch Magnet? There's is it just band, gigs? Is it a, like there's a band called Bitch Magnet? We start playing uh, in the college pretty quickly. Seung and I were very motivated. These um, are like the bars and clubs, and, or dude, we're playing like living rooms. We're playing like <laughs> yeah, I mean, like we're playing dining rooms. I mean, we, we were playing, <laughs> we were playing where you can play on Friday and Saturday nights in Oberlin, Ohio, to reasonably a reasonably tolerant audience. People, more people start coming out. Traction. It took a while. We, Once a while, a uh, year. Well, it seemed like forever it was probably a year. Okay. Um, and uh, you know, we we started getting traction outside reasonably quickly. We made we recorded something. People liked it. We put it out ourselves. It sold out. We got picked up by a label. We started touring um, the Eastern Seaboard and the Midwest. We started while we're still in college. We're touring the Midwest on weekends. Go to Chicago. So at the point you're talking about now. What year are we talking about? This is 1988, 89. And Eastern Seaboard, does that include New York? Yes. So like, like you, give me some we, venues. I, I mean, you, you remember? So on a, on fall break, we would play Boston at the Middle East. We'd play New York at CBGB or the Pyramid or both. Um, I don't think we played Maxwell's in Hoboken until... Uh, the 1990 tour, um, Todd. DC at a place called DC space. Um, I'm blanking on the rest of the so, stuff. Like so cool various places and all that. Yeah. But I mean, it, it wasn't like a cool spot. It was like, that was where this yeah. kind of music happened. It's, it's easy to look back. Are you not doing semester school to tour or you're juggling both? I'm juggling both. Um, the guys in the band, Orestes graduated before us, so we had a remote situation for a while. And uh, Su Young took a semester off, but like we were, we were able to keep it going. How long was the run? I mean, how long? Uh, we formed in mid late eighties. Oh well, I'll give you the exact dates. Uh, we formed a November of nineteen eighty six. We started playing with Orestes in April of eighty seven, which is really the beginning of the band. Uh, we broke up after the second European tour um, in late 1990, four years. And three albums, two tours of Europe, like touring around the States. Did you know what was going on? Like I just saw a documentary on Santana and the guy just had no idea what was going on when everything was blowing up. I know, I know it's a different level, but do you realize like, hey, we have a band, we have a following, we're going to Europe or it's just so much. Oh, it, I was very aware of it and the, the knowledge of it made my head explode and made it hard to be around me, which is how the band that I formed. In a bad way? Yeah. Um, I, I was, you know, I was a very... Um, I was an angry young punk rocker <laughs> and the attention went to my head. I was kicked out of my own band for several months because the guys couldn't deal with me. Like chill the F out, you know, or more like get the fuck out, I think. But, um, <laughs> okay. but then they asked me back and we made another record and we, we did another swing through Europe. Um, uh, band broke up at the end of 1990. I did other bands through the nineties in New York. Um, bitch magnet, our records were re we, we made three out records uh, between eighty six and ninety. Our records were reissued in two thousand eleven. We got asked to reunite by Didn't the. Did you go back out or get back? To we got asked to reunite by the All Tomorrow's Parties Festival and um, uh, the UK. We agreed to reconvene. We did a reunion tour, one swing through Europe, two two swings through Asia where Su Young was living, one swing through America, put it on the shelf, and 
anyway, that this is roughly the arc of my book, as well as the entire story. Did of, it go well? I mean, the reunion stuff. I mean, people were coming out. You guys were somewhat getting along. The music sounded was, good. We did not make a lot of money, but it was the first time we made money on the band. I'm not sure this time it was only about the money. It was not. I mean, I would have. I would have done it anyway. Yeah. I'm, I'm, well, yeah. Let, let me rephrase that. Like, Cover your expenses. <laughs> it was it was a complicated um, thing. I lived in New York. Orestes lived in Canada at the time, and uh, Si Young was living in Singapore. So just for us to get wow. in a room together to yeah. practice cost thousands of dollars, but it it, it worked out, and um, I, it was an amazing experience. I mean, like I need to be clear about this. Like we were not famous like i say this in my book like you know we're talking about a milieu of underground not music. even famous in a certain circle i mean in, in a certain circle yes in, in, in a certain punk. circle but that's significant it, well i i need to benchmark this because like you know people have a different idea of what this looks like um you know there we're talking about a subset of music that a hundred thousand people care deeply about of the you know 10 to twenty thousand people cared about bitch magnet and of that there are 500 to 1,000 people who would, you know, get on planes and cross time zones to see us play live. Right. Or buy I f- a I record. F- oh, well, I mean, forget buying. I mean, buying a record was a little more than 500 or 1,000. But I mean, people traveled great distances to see us. It moved me beyond words. And if I keep talking about it, I'm probably going to get choked up. All right. Don't get choked up. Um, it's, it's good so you over. mentioned it a couple times. It led you to write a book about sort of that arc, that experience, right? Well, yeah, when I was a much older man, yes. Um, when did you write the book? Uh, I, I wrote the book. The book came out in, gosh, 2015 or 2016. I was... So not that long ago. No, no. I was convinced. How long was it percolating in your head? Or I went to a um, high-ranking editor at, a, at Penguin Books named Rick Cott, uh with a different book idea. Did and you have like at least contacts, networking, or connections in those days or not necessarily? My, my, my agent introduced him to me. Okay. Like, like this is, you know, I'm... 40 something years old. And, um, Rick had no interest in the book, but he's like the book idea I had, which was about organic people going off the grid and doing organic stuff. It's not worth talking about. Never wrote it. (laughs) Um, but Rick was like, well, what else is going on with you? And I'm like, well, this and that. And you know, it's really weird. Um, uh, I was in this band in the late eighties and early nineties and, uh, you know, we broke up, but we got asked, our records got reissued. We got asked to reunite and I think we're going to do it. And Rick was like, oh, really? Start thinking and, about and, it. And then he was like, that's your book. And I'm like, no, it isn't. And he said, yeah, it is. So I wrote a proposal and he bought it. But the book goes back from the reunion days, you know, the beginnings. The, and The book is a memoir um, of me, which is weird because I'm not famous or even particularly interesting. But it, it's a means to tell the story of this particular subset of like aggressive, weird underground music from the 80s and 90s. You know, the signal bands from that this group or, uh, you know, Sonic Youth, um, you know, some of the weirder bands from Seattle, right. a lot of bands from Chicago, um, you know, Mission of Burma from Boston, right. stuff like that. You know, who were pretty- And, it's, and it's, a, it's a thorny love letter at that time. It was very, that, that, so those people are very important to me. You've probably read more than a handful of books covering those type of subjects. Did the book come out as, did it represent- what you wanted to present. Um, when you look back, did you do a good job or you look back and go, I'm a little embarrassed? No, I'm, 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 uh, I'm not proud of, I'm not blanket proud of stuff I've done. I'm, I'm very, not prou- what you've done, how you wrote about it. And I, portrayed. I wouldn't, I'd change very little of it. I'm, I'm, I'm quite proud of the book. So and, and, and the bigger point is that, um, to my surprise, Penguin, you know, this, they let me do exactly what I wanted. They, major, they didn't, major player. Too. Yeah, they, they did not lay a finger on it. Um, it was a great experience. So let's make another transition. Well, let's yeah, enough just, about this punk rock shit, too. Well, no. If, you're, if your interest is peaked, and it should be, the book's called Your Band Sucks, and I'm sure you could find it. It's available everywhere. Yeah. Um, so with all kind of this stuff going on, where's the transition to from – book, music, when did the writing thing kind of settle in as a vocation? The writing thing settled in pretty quickly because um, I got to New York City after college, after the last round of Bitch Magnet stuff, and uh, I knew I was going to keep playing music, but I had to support myself. And um, I had the brilliant idea of um, going into journalism as a money-making move, which was, you know, it was a choice. That okay. was definitely a choice. Um, uh, 
but I, I just, you know, I found a situation, I found situations that I liked. I found people I liked. Um, and it was hard for me to conceive of doing stuff that other people around me were doing to make a buck. And, uh, I always knew I wanted to write. So it, it worked. So, you know, I mentioned in the intro some places. Yeah, was, you know, was that the you editor in chief. I ended up acting editor in chief of Inc. I was, I was a but what was what was some of week. the early stuff you did? Oh, the early like stuff break. I was writing for these like doomed trade magazines, <laughs> mostly about media. Um, there was one called News Inc., which nobody knows about. It went out of business pretty quickly. Although it was a very good magazine. Um, I ended up at a magazine called Advertising Age, which people know about. Had a, had a pretty good run there. It's years. kind of the book on the business that it cranes is. later on. Yeah, yeah, I was I was writing about media. I wasn't writing about advertising. I right. find media much more interesting. And uh, then I I was poached by a Business Week to do a media column. Um, and then I did that. So we're going to get into it, but when did the wine stuff become like wh where? Like you're the editor in chief of the New Wine Review. Let's go backwards because we're going to go forward. Where did the wine thing kind of, you know, coagulate? Where going forward, it's a thing now. It, it, it took a while. Um, I was really broke in my twenties, as many people in their twenties are. My dad had some interest in wine. Um, Growing up, yeah, it was a, it was around, but like I didn't get it and. There were, I thought there were statusy things around it that made it really distasteful as a, you know, as a young punk rocker. You picked up on that early? It, it's, it's hard not to, um, you know, like there's a ritual in a restaurant and like, I just be like, like, fuck this shit. Give me a beer. Like, <laughs> give, you know, like give me a rolling rock. I don't give a fuck. Um, and also, you know, when you're in your twenties, at least I was, you know, you, you're drinking with a goal in mind, you know, like you're not necessarily looking for the right thing to pair with your dinner. You, you, you're, you're trying to get fucked up. Um, Shit face, or, yeah. Yeah, and and you've Bust. got you've got a significant capacity for that. But that recovery. was the difference between you and your dad. That's how you perceived it. Your dad Well, my, my dad wasn't buying cheap beers at like, you know, deafening punk rock clubs. Um anyway, so it was around and like my dad would pour it and I try and I just didn't get it. Um a couple of things happened. One was in my late 20s and I wish I could remember the bottle. It really bugs me, but it's reasonable to think that it was a Stag's Leap um, wine cellars, you know, Warren Winiarski, who just rest, passed rest away. Soul, rest yeah, soul. Good um, dude. Yeah, great, great and important winemaker too. Um, my dad likes Stag's Leap and I, he poured me probably just their straight up Napa cab, probably from the late 80s. And I tasted it and I was like, now, now I kind of get it. Like th 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 there's something going on here. And like light bulb kind of dimly went on. And honestly, the the main thing that happened was um, there's a writer named uh, Willie Gluckster who – I know the name. Not so much. he was the buyer for an important wine shop um, on the Upper West Side called Nancy's Wines. And um, when people were into a lot of spoofulated bullshit wine in the uh, 90s, you know, he was buying tons of Riesling. He was buying Cabernet Franc. And he wrote this book called The Wine Avenger, which is this thick. Um, I'm holding my fingers like a – quarter of an inch right. apart, paperback book. Um, and he just, you know, I'd, I'd been reading lots of punk rock fanzines. I was used to that kind of, a, a certain kind of um, oppositional writing style. And Willie Gluckstern just comes in and from page one, he's like, Napa Cabernet is bullshit. Chardonnay is bullshit. You know, I don't know what's great. Riesling is great. Chenin Blanc is great. Cabernet Franc, people th people think it sucks. They're wrong. It's fucking great. It goes Man, was he on it? And and it's and it's it's like it's a breath of fresh air. And so, um, along with you know Justin Truno, who's now pretty big in wine, we, Justin and I were in bands together. Not the same band, but like we we toured with each other. We Justin from the Four Horsemen. That's Justin Truno from the Four Horsemen. Um, uh, full disclosure, I'm an investor in that restaurant, but I would love it even if I wasn't. Um, Hard not to. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and, uh, you know, Justin and I would, you know, we, we used to go record shopping and we started going to Nancy's Wines on the Upper East Side and buying, instead of buying records, we're buying $15 bottles of Prune, you know, like $13.99 bottles of, you know, Baudry Cabernet Franc. Um, crazy. It was so much fun. And like, I remember once, like we're going through it and we're like, you know, filling up a bag and Justin turns to me and he's like, man, this is more fun than shopping for records. Was he about a far along 
with wine as you were? Was he a little more evolved? We were, we the were two both, of you were at a point where you were we, inquisitive? We were both inquisitive at the same time. Right. You know, at the same time together. And like, you know, we, we had a friend group um, that was getting interested in it. And um, that segued into the first wave of natural wine in, um, you know, hitting America. So I guess we're talking the first, what, what do we call the first decade of the century? We still don't know, right? Uh, Is it the aughts? Is it the noughties? I have no idea. That's a okay, good question. It's, it's the OOs, people. Um, like, email us here and let us know what we should call this fucking decade. It was 20 years ago now. That's right. Um, 24. And so, you know, Justin was working at an important wine shop in Williamsburg called Uva, became the buyer. And, you know, um, Foyard is on the shelf for 20 bucks. Um, I'm going to mispronounce it. I meant to look it up. Domaine des Ans, Domaine Two Asses, a Corbier that we loved, 1399. Um, Les Artiques, um, a all biodynamic Grenache. You can still get it for nine bucks. I mean, th- th- that was, that was the wedding wine at my, my wife and, and when my wife and I got married, that was one of the wedding wines. And, um, I was, I was still in a Riesling, but like when, it became about natural wine. It, but that, so I just interrupted you. And go I ahead. didn't mean to, but work this in the question. Because um, I, I don't even know if calling it natural wine or whatever, but w- what what's the attraction or the awakening? What do you realize about this versus anything else? You know, maybe Gluckstern and the store influenced you, but it seems like you, like, like how do you realize? Because that's, I know Justin is, and I want to talk to you about that, you know, where your compass on wines are and everything. What, what, what's the realization then? The like, realization. Like, did you know no sulfur is like. Oh, I mean, n- n- not in the nineties for sure, but I mean. But so what's. Well, well the, the realization is with the Gluckstern book that this can be fun, that this is accessible at a price point that even a broke, you know, like late twenties musician can afford. Did um, you like the contrarian part? You and know that this well, isn't what that, that, that was the most important thing. There was like a real kind of sense of opposition about it, where that like all of the stuff that you dislike about big wine, you're right. It's bullshit. And by the way, here's this other stuff that's better, it's cooler, it's more fun, and it's accessible. Like, like you can do it. And you know, you are it it gave us a framework to look at this stuff. And to understand that there was a different way of looking at it in a way that was immediately understandable to us. Um, and then, then you get to natural wine, which is like overtly, like, I hate to put it in these terms, but I'm not the first one. Like, it, it was an overtly punk rock, mu- you know, movement. There, there was like no, I a, get that. I mean, a that's real a sense fair, of anger and that's not the and characterization, well, it, it's, it's, but it's a good character. It, it's a cliche now, but, yeah. I, but it definitely felt that way. And um the personalities were vivid. Um, I mean, I remember meeting Frank Cornelison for the first time. Um, and also the, my palate has changed as it does, but, um, the extremity of certain natural wines, like we were attracted to the extremity in the way that many people new to natural wine still are. Like the fact that Cornelison wine would have, I guess it's a form of sediment. I don't, I couldn't tell you what it was like. It like, like chunks right. of almost phlegm floating yeah. in it. Like we thought it was awesome. Um, his wines, by the way, are now clean and precise and delicious. I know. And, um, you know, that, um, Monte Segundo, which is a great natural producer from Tuscany, like that, it had this very, like, kind of sweaty horse saddle taste that we now know as bread. Like, we fucking love that. We're like, give me that. And, you know, eventually you, you, you just sort of, sort of hone in on stuff and you appreciate different things. Um, but I mean, it, it's a great, it was a great gateway. Was. And it was so much fucking fun. Was Uva bringing that stuff in as you were discovering it? Absolutely. Did they start bringing more of it because you discovered it? Like was Uva a little ahead of the curve before you guys? Uva, I I would have to go back and see the timing on that. Um, I think Uva came in in the- But not far apart. No, right? and, and I think I think it really amped up when Justin started buying there. And like, you know, the, then a crew sort of formed there. And, um, you know, like um, guys and women in their late 20s, early 30s, who it was just a very different experience than walking into Sherry Lehman or even Astor Wines at the time, which was my, which is what I thought wine was. And so yeah. it becomes accessible. It becomes something that you talk about with your friends. It has that sense of opposition. It's delicious. It's cool. It's fun. It's changeable. It goes with food. And it turns out, you know, it's endless. Um, and well, it, let, let me just get this thought. Go in. Ahead. Um, and the, it was an easy framework to graft onto for us because 
I grew up, I still am very deeply into music. And when you get really deeply into music and really deeply into punk rock scenes, I mean, let me tell you about Richmond, Virginia, Sam. There was, <laughs> there was a band called Honor Roll, uh, R-O-L-E. There was a guitarist in that band named Penn Rawlings. Penn is an amazing guitarist. Now, if you listen to the bands from Richmond from that era, they all kind of sound like Penn a little bit. And some bands from Raleigh, North Carolina kind of do too, because Honor Roll played there a lot. And like that is immediately translatable to, okay, so this winemaker spent a few years working with Foyard. Then that winemaker went to his or her region and people started following them. And it, it's just, it's the exact same kind of thinking. And so we're just grafting a different topic onto a map that we already had in our brain. And instead of it being, you know, Richmond, Virginia, and Louisville, it's, you know, Beaujolais. It's Burgundy. It's, it's, you know, places in the Loire. That may be the best wine music analogy I've gotten on this show. And I've asked people to make the analogy. So um, when it comes to award season, you can expect a little medal on that analogy. Uh, just don't, um, don't edit that out, Sam. I will not. I told you I don't edit. He doesn't um, edit people. I want to ask, we're going to take a break soon. And after the break, we're going to, you know, get into what's going on at the new wine review. Love it. Um, this is a general question and, you know, you're the right guy to ask it. Give me your best shot. What do you, what's your take on the current state of wine writing, wine review, criticism, wine media, which wasn't a thing, podcasting, we're doing a podcast now, TikTok's a thing, YouTube. Again, this could be a whole show, but what are your first impulses, instincts, answers? Um, I, I am working at a, a wine startup, uh, the New Wine Review, uh, a wine media startup, because we think there's a place for a different kind of voice. Um, you know, there are publications out there that I admire enormously. Um, I really love Noble Rot. I like Punch a great deal. I wish they did more about wine. Um, most of the pure play established, um, you know, review oriented sites, um, they don't particularly speak to me. They don't particularly speak to my palate. They don't particularly speak to my friends' palates. Um, and you know, you're looking at me, Sam, luckily the rest of you are not, I'm, I'm not a young man. I'm in my fifties. Um, but too you're much, no kid. I am no kid. Um, too much of existing wine media reads like it was written for my grandfather. And I want to be clear, like I but subscribe to a lot of these guys were around when your grandfather oh, sure. was young and they kind of, you know, they were, let's be specific, you know, Parker and wine spectator basically morphed into online because they had to. Well, I mean, Spectator's this, still, Spectator still a print magazine. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you, you, you do have to, you have to morph into online. I, I, I don't really draw distinctions between magazine versus uh yeah no i'm not yeah. I'm, I'm talking more um so I, I when we come back i want to talk to you about you know what you thought you know that niche or something that you yeah. can come in um does that old guard still have sway or are demographics changing I mean, they, they, they seem to be going. They still have subscribers. Um, I'm, I'm Do sure you that, see a demographic shift? Like, are you not posturing? Are you doing this to reach a certain audience demographically? You and I were in the media business. Um, we, we think that there is a different generation of serious wine drinkers out there that have not been um, addressed well by the vast majority of the wine media properties out there. Um, and we think there's a, there's a different way to do it. And that's what we're doing. Um, going back a little, I mean, how has the internet changed wine writing and wine review criticism or just, is it great? Is it more democratized? I mean, you're kind of in on that game. I mean, it, it certainly, it makes the information much more accessible. Um, you know, I, I really hate um, going back to personal experience on this because, you know, it makes me sound and feel like I'm a thousand years old. But, <laughs> you know, like I found a book when I was, I don't know, 29 or 30 called The Wine Avenger. I mean, that was the first time I had heard any attitude like that about wine. That is much more easy to find now. Um, and it's much more easy to segment into, you know, I want natural wine or like I'm interested in this region or yeah, I'm making this up. Like I'm, I want to go really deep on South African wine or, or whatever. Um, that's easier. Um, it, it also leads to these wild swings in the market where, 
you know, a wine becomes big on Instagram, you know, like Beanie, and all of a sudden it's unaffordable. Uh, and like, that's, I'm not saying that's good or bad. It is what it is. Um, you know, and th there's an entire ecosystem of influencers around everything. Um, I, it, it's, it's like, uh, it, it is how media works now. I know. And, and so, some of them are great. A lot of them are great. I mean, actually, discovery you know? is great yeah. and the internet and social media yeah. gives you that opportunity. But I think you stated some, uh, you know, the negatives you pushed off. I did. Well, no, you push stuff that's less available, becomes more expensive. I, I mean, it, 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 it's a tricky thing. I mean, like, it's easy to um, criticize Robert Parker. It's easy to criticize, like, what, um, you know, when people were making wines for his palate, which is not necessarily my palate. Uh, you're talking about a guy, though, who was determined to democratize wine, who was determined to, I mean, early on, he was discovering stuff that people didn't know about, like Vegas, Sicilia. Like, these are great wines. What's interesting is he was kind of on that right track early on. It's just how people categorize his taste and the influence and all of that. I mean, yeah, sure. I mean, to, but he was independent. But he didn't that's take a, advertising he was, he was like Wine yeah. Spectator. Yeah. He definitely had his own compass. I mean, like, I just, like, I like Burgundy a lot more than he apparently did. I mean, that's fine. You know. <laughs> Does he ever talk about it? Um, it's funny. All right. So we're talking to John Fine. John is going to talk to us about the new wine review. Um, you're listening to The Grape Nation on the Heritage Radio Network. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. All right, we're back. We're back with my guest, John Fine. John Fine is the editor in chief of the New Wine Review. I don't even know if the New Wine Review is a year old. Maybe this oh, month. Oh, it's not even close to being a year old. Yeah, uh, we, we we launched uh, we launched late on February 29th of this year. Oh, I thought you launched last June, but I um, it was it was sort of it was sort of in beta for a while. But like we we did a, a much more full featured relaunch in um in uh, late February with like revamped um revamped editorial uh like a much more built out uh, private Slack for our subscribers where we gather and gossip and tell weird stories to each other and talk about wine. <laughs> All right, so let me get the vitals out of the way. Um, I'm five. Foot, I'm five foot nine. Five foot nine. 360. Okay, okay, fine. I'm five foot seven and three quarters. I knew it. I'll sit here and wait till you go to five five and a half. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not five five and a half. <laughs> I'm patient. All right. So let me get the vitals out of the way. When, why, and how did the new wine review come about? It had to be a bunch of people. Somebody had an idea. Thanks, Jill. Tell me about plant the seed for me. Sure. The founder and CEO, uh, Xander Barron, who's uh he's spent you know, a fair amount of time in media. He was at the Atlantic. He was at the New York Times. He had a consulting gig at um, uh, at the Wine Spectator for a while. And um, he is into wine and he's into media. And, you know, he was working, I think most recently as, um, if you know, Outside Magazine. Um, he was overseeing like all their editorial operations for um, all of their properties. Xander, I hope I got that right. Please don't, you know, Please don't kick my ass if I is if I outside did. like that active yes. lifestyle outdoor yes. and then and they have a bunch of other titles underneath yeah. it as well. Um and you know, he had the idea for doing, you know, a next generation, for lack of a better term, wine publication. And uh, we started talking in October of last year and uh we, we got serious pretty quickly and I signed on in December and I started in January. Is he a wine guy? Like He's if a wine we guy, sat yeah. with him and went back you know, not similar stories to you, but connections at different points. Oh, for sure. I, th I think um, he's less obsessed in a bad way than I am, um, <laughs> but he's he's certainly into wine. Like we've, we've shared some really great bottles and told some great stories about them. Um, so the last, the last um, knickknack question is, w were you able to set an objective or a mission or you play as you go? Like, what did you want to do or be? We believe that there is an underserved uh, audience here. I'm sorry, that, that that's very up here. I'm gesturing with my hand way above my head. There is, in our view, and th th this is pretty much all the top staff there. Uh, this is Xander Barron. This is um, uh, Brittany Martin, who was high up at Los Angeles Magazine and now does 
pretty much everything in our magazine. This is Jason Wilson, our star writer, used to run a successful Substack, and our amazing assistant editor is Sarah Jang, Par- Sarah Parker Jang, sorry, Sarah and Sarah Keen. Um, there is a conversation that's been going on around wine. Uh, like, let's say this started in the French natural wine bars of the early part of the century. Uh, kind of the stuff we're talking about with like the Willie Gluckstern book and like this understanding that wine can be something else. And, you know, the, the natural wine bars of Paris pretty soon moved to London and Copenhagen and Tokyo and New York, and now they're everywhere. Um, we did a story, there, there's a great, na- there's a natural wine bar in Sarasota. There are natural wine bars in Iowa. By the way, no diss on these cities, but they're just not as big as New York City or London. Um, we did probably a, can't get everything that you get in some bigger cities. I mean, there, there is an inherent unfairness in what you can yeah. get, but I mean, you can run a natural wine shop with natural wines, you know, and smart in these places. And I'll give you an even better example. We wrote about a, a wine bar called Versi Vini. This is in Ma- the bustling metropolis of Maple Shade, New Jersey. It's in a strip mall. It's right near a place that, where you that's can- That's down by Philly, right? You're, you're very good. I had no idea where the fuck it was and I grew up in New Jersey. Um, sorry, apologies to Versi. Making friends. Love you guys. Making friends fast. I mean, they're right by a place where you can donate plasma and a place where you can change your tires. Strip bars. They have a completely sick wine list. You and I would go there and be peeing ourselves with delight. This is everywhere now. And there's a conversation that's going on in places like that. There's a conversation that's going on in the better wine stores in every city around the world. And, you know, we're not convinced. We don't think that that conversation has really been reflected well in the vast majority of the wine media out there. We think, you know, those are our people. We think that's our opportunity. And we think there's, you know, we're convinced there's enough serious people that are serious about wine to, you know, subscribe to us. So you just mentioned a handful of some great writers. What's the setup? Everyone's a contributor to the site, but committed to the site? Um, I mentioned like staff. I mentioned the six, the whopping staff of six that we have, you know, that 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 are, you know, full-time and there. I mean, there, there, there's a variety of roles there. I mean, Xander is the CEO. He's too busy to write. Um, you know, Brittany. But the woman from L.A., is she uh, doing she, L.A. and she, this? She, uh, no, 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 no. I mean, we're all, we're th- this is what we're doing. Okay. I mean, it's a startup, dude. Like, we're... Like, you know, well, no, it's nice, nice that nice everyone's head, is, you know, great people have their head yeah. down. And, and, and we, we have a passel of uh, freelancers and contributors, um, you know, as well, uh, for sure. So you attempted to talk about this before, and you even mentioned some guys. And I'm not sure I want to start this way, but there's punch out there. The magazines have sites. Like I mentioned, there's other media like podcasting, you know, which could be pretty extensive. Um, Donick, Parker, all those guys. All those guys. Why? Mostly guys. Mostly guys. We, we forgot Jancis, who I've got great respect for. Right. Who does it pretty well. Big fan. You know, why? I hate asking this question, but why? You're going anyway. Why? You know, why would I go to your site and, you know, what am I going to get? Um, you know, you, I, I am interested in Noble Rod. I even like Rachel Signer, you know, people like that, but why, you know, I, I need you in a good way. I mean, it's, it's a taste and perspective thing. If like what I've been saying, uh, and you know, what like Jason Wilson was writing about on his Substack, and his very successful Substack before he came on, um, appeals to you, then, you know, you kind of get it and you'll, you'll appreciate what we're writing about, like how we're writing about it. Um, the way we think about wine, the way we get excited about wine, and, you know, the way we talk about it in our Slack as well. Right. Um, and, you know, if you're interested in scores, we have a, it's in beta, but we have a database that, you know, we, we found a way to, um, you know, give a kind of critical consensus number from one to a hundred, um, you know, for a great deal of wines that are out there. Well, so we're still fine tuning that. And, and they're, they're metrics. This is the scores and insight section. That, that, that is the insight there, section, you, yes. you know, on the landing page. On the landing page, It, it yes. says scores and insights. Yep. And you can get wine scores. And what do you have, about 15,000, 20,000? Uh, I think it's around 20 now. I think and it's around your 20. aspirations, obviously. Yeah, are bigger. Like, I mean, like, we're, we're, we're testing and we're learning from it. Um, I, I'm also not in charge of that, so I can't really speak so that much to it. So answer two questions. The first question is, do you have any skepticism beyond your scores of wine scores? And then tell me the mechanics of how you do scores and insights, because it's not just score, right. 98, 93, it's scores and insights. I can, I can talk about the insights because then I understand that the, 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 the scores themselves, it wasn't my project. So I, I, I literally don't know um, that stuff. But um, uh, I'm sorry, what was the first question? <laughs> 
do you have any skepticism of existing wine scoring? So that, I mean, yes, uh, broadly. Um, but I can also tell you that I subscribe to Jensis Robinson. I subscribe to Berghound. I subscribe to Drink Rhone. Um, and I subscribe to Winehog, uh, all of whom in one form or another do scores. I guess Winehog kind of doesn't. Well, but Winehog's those are people, I guess if you find people that you trust and have similar sensibilities, I guess scoring works, right? I mean, I find it directionally, I mean, I'm speaking to someone now just as a consumer who buys a lot of wine, who's been subscribing to these sites for a long time. Um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's useful. You get to know the quirks of the um, uh, palettes, and you also find out that even if that's the case, you know, you might totally disagree with like, you know, uh, I bought a bunch of a certain kind of California Pinot on Berghound's recommendation. If you want to buy it for me, I'll cut you a really good deal on it. You didn't like it? Um, it did not go the way I thought it would. I, I mean, it's perfectly good. It's just was not, it not too not big thing. or no, it just didn't hit the heights that I was hoping it would hit and the heights that, um, you know, that, um, he seemed to think it would. And by the way, that guy's got a hell of a palate. But is that one of the few disagreements you have maybe? I, you know, oh boy, Hard th to th say, that right? is such a huge, I mean, like I like certain producers much more than he does. Um, and there, there are a lot of producers I love that he doesn't get you. Which so is you totally found fine. your own way, but you're always looking to see what he's tasting and looking at. Which I am is curious. I, I'm very curious. But I mean, you know, scores in general are very useful to people. It's not the way that I look at the world necessarily. But at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm checking them out. You know, right. like, I, I, like, I mean, my palate might be closest out of all of them to the Weinhaw guy or to, um, uh, I'm forgetting his name, um, the guy who does uh, Drink Roan. Um, yeah, I don't know. Who super, that is. It, it's great. I super, to, super idiotic. Really you may have enlightened me to somebody I never knew of. His, uh, he's a is super. Is it just Roan, or he spreads out? Only, it's Roan. Okay. Um, I, I think he's done like you know ten reviews over the years of Australian Syrah too. Um, Syrah is very important to me. We'll talk about the Northern Rhine. I was just there. All right, so that's the skepticism part. Right. Um, tell but, me I mean, about. But, well, the, but the bigger thing is this. I mean, a lot of the scores matter to a lot of people, um, and if that's useful to people. We're happy to find a way that you know to to do it in an interesting way, and you know we'll see we'll see what people think. You know, it may be that they maybe that they love that, it may be that they respond to something else. So you said the scores thing you're not that involved in, but tell me what you do know. Is it an aggregation of other reviewers, peer reports? I mean, how do you get a score? Do you know? We have we have a proprietary algorithm, and you that, do. That's, that's pretty much all. That's pretty much okay. all I know about so it. So whatever and, and, is and in that out, you. But the other thing is the other thing is that on top of that, we put metrics where you know you can find out not just the score, but also like is it ranked in the top fifty of Pinot Noir? Is this the insight part? The, yeah, the, those so are the tell insights me, and the metrics. So you get you have an algorithm for score. Tell me what the insights add. Yeah, the, the insights add basically like you know this is one of the top wines in the world under a hundred dollars. This is one of the you know, within this range of price, this is one of the best Nebbiolas in the database, you know, that this may only, he says with air quotes around the microphone, get a 93, but it's actually one of the top scoring, you know, like, you know, uh, I guess we'll say Loire Reds because it's really funny. Loire Reds don't seem to get the love from the score people. Right, the 93 that, could be a great score yeah, exactly. in Loire. And then I, Everybody's I, thinking, oh, I don't drink anything less than a 97. That, that's, this is the killer I, that, Loire. I, th I think we all agree that that can be somewhat uh, somewhat misguided. So I think that's useful. I mean, no, when, I you, so when you look at a, a retail card, it never says anything like that. You know, so it definitely appeals to maybe a more interested, possibly more intelligent um, wine consumer. I don't know. Um, just take a second when you land on the page, mm -hmm. one of the sections we just talked about scores and insights where you can go to a whole database. You could look it up. Maybe it's there probably, maybe not. There's a lot of stories and coverage. So just but when I land on the site, just tell me quickly what I'm seeing. This is the sell part. You got to do this. Fantastic. Um, uh, you know, it's really funny. I spent so much time in the innards of our WordPress that I don't really see that that much. But I mean, you know, you, you will see at the top, you'll see, you know, three stories, which are stuff that we're either promoting because they're timely or because they're the most recent. You will see a trending, um, like kind of a little heat map of like the top five stories or so. Um, you will see several different departments, which, you know, honestly, we 
switch around, you know, depending on the year. Like, um, you know, we had something more wintry uh, earlier in the year. We'll probably have something lighter later in the year. We uh, have a section of great reads, which is, you know, the longer narrative stuff that we've done. Um, great deal of that is by uh, Jason Wilson, um, who's, you know, our, our senior correspondent, our top writer. Um, and, you know, and it's in that section where, you know, we throw a few punches. Like one, one of my favorite pieces, uh, which he did, and one of the first he did, which was, um, you know, when I first met him, we were um, drinking, you know, Chasselot, some fondue place. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was his idea. It was a great idea. It was, it, was, it, was like, it was like the middle of December, so it was perfect. And, you know, I was saying to him, like, God, I really want us to go out on day one with like a big attention-getting story. And, and like, he just started riffing. He was like, you know, like, there's a vintage of the century every other year in Bordeaux. And there's like four vintages of the century in Napa. And like, there's never one in the Loire. It's like, God, that's like just, and I'm like, Run with, run with that. That's the story. And so we have a story called the many vintages of the century, you know, and it's like, wow, like it's a back to back to back, you know, vintages of the century in Bordeaux again. And yet like nothing in, Aust nothing in Austria, like nothing in the Loire. Like, why is that? That's kind of weird. And I don't want to give the story away. I mean, cause he went much deeper and, and much more into it than that, but it's like, this is something that's going on that I think we all understand is kind of weird to put it nicely. And it's nice to be able to put a finger on that. Like, you know, we love wine, but there's a lot about the world of it that's just kind of, you know, like if you think about it, it's a little, is this the way we really want to think about it? Is this the way we really talk about wine now? Well, I don't know if it's to that point, but you've kind of made it clear that you'll pay attention to writing about, you know, certain things like the Loire certainly deserves attention. All the other guys are getting the vintage of the years and all that. Do you pay specific attention? Is it part of your objective to talk about or get behind things like regenerative farming, organics, biodynamics, that whole natural thing, small producers? I mean, is that generally where things fall? Because I, I know you explain that's what's important to you, to me and all that. Is that where this site, you know, without trying or pushing it shines? You know, I, I think um, our starting point are uh, smaller, lower dimensionist producers um, all over the world, all over the world. And I mean, you know, they're, they're concentrated in certain areas. And like everyone else, we're deeply interested in Burgundy. We've written about Burgundy a lot. Um, we're also deeply interested in Spain and New Spain, which is one of Jason Wilson's thing. Like, you know, we think that's one of the most exciting places in the world right now. Spain you, you seems like you're going to interrupt me. Well, here. no, Spain is easier to me than Burgundy. What's, what's the catch angle on Burgundy? There's a lot of inaccessible, overpriced, terrific stuff. You could say Domain Romani Conti's biodynamic is there a coverage or a story on burgundy new producers natural producers shantara you know what do you take the ball and run with what you believe or so um jason jacobite who um runs the excellent wine shop uh, psalm sellers in new york city where is that in new that york? is uh it's in Up. the 50s uh it's at like five riverside drive it's a place so, that nobody goes to wasn't he like a psalm? He was a psalm that drew Nipar. Yeah, I think. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I and hope then I another guy right. opened yeah, it. Up. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. It's a great shop, but he did two really great um, Burgundy pieces for us. One of them is about uh, like the five micro negociants in Burgundy that you need to know. This was I'm gonna I should remember them off the top of my head, but Chanteria for sure. Um, uh, Les Ores. I'm gonna mispronounce all this shit. By the way, I hope you clean well, this up and edit. Let me um, clean this up for you. Yeah, it, it's all in the new wine review. It's part of the stories, and it's a kind of a but featured story or way, pushed to the top. Here's the here's one of the ways that we think about regions. You know, like um, we're interested in like new is very important to us, and like if there's a new generation bubbling up in a region where and they're doing good stuff, we're really interested in it. The other story that Jason did to your point about value. I mean, yeah, Burgundy prices are crazy. Like we all know instinctively it's the best wine in the world, you know, and the pricing has just gotten out of control. Jason did a piece for us on, um, you know, single vineyard expressions in Burgundy that are under $80, you know, and in many cases under 50, like the, the one that I'm, the one that we're going to talk about later today. In we'll fact, talk about that. Um, which is mentioned in that piece. And the point isn't to do another piece about budget burgundy and a bunch of like, you know, Bourgogne stuff. Like this is the real thing. This is like single vineyards. This is the vineyard talking to you through the hands of a skilled producer. 
that like you can still get that level of information at that price point. See, and you can. You said something that I don't see your site as an article on budget burgundy. I see maybe that in Vine Pair. I think and hope and see and hear that it's about thoughtful producers, people that have been doing it that maybe you never heard of. That's exactly pricing and value. Like this guy is great, but it's 160. You know, how many stories can you do about Arnold LaShaw or whatever? Yeah. You, however you. And it. and th what is fascinating, you know, like is that is Burgundy broadly too expensive? Absolutely. Like are the benchmark producers we all know like more expensive and getting more expensive? Absolutely. Is a lot of the new wave, like as soon as they're discovered, uh, Domaine Cassiope, um, probably Jerome Galleron, like they're going to skyrocket too. Sylvain but, Patel, uh, yeah, you forget know, it. Mars yeah. is, was a thing, now it's- Well, because, because people like us are talking about it yeah. too much, but we can't help ourselves because it's great yeah. wine. But the point is that, you know, there's still great young energy happening there and there's still producers that are going to areas that are not really well known and discovering great terroir. You know, climate change, unfortunately, is kind of helping some of these areas. And- there are people that are still finding ways to do it in ways that like, is it, it's not $15, but Burgundy never is. And it's, it's right. something that is just much more accessible, right? And much more. And it's, and it reads and feels like Burgundy and you get the story and the feeling of like, you know, the profundity, um, the joyousness and the sense of the vineyard speaking to you. Um, Jason did a great job with that piece. And yeah, that's right. That That's why it's not called best budget Burgundy. Cause that's not what it's about. It's right. about single vineyard stuff you know, at a reasonable price. So how do you determine stories? The writers come to you, you get a sense of what's going on there. Something pushes itself up. You know, what, what am I terrible to say all of the above? I mean, uh, you know, Any, like, can like you move add ongoing? anything or am I the new editor? Of I, I, mean, well, I mean, occasionally, occasionally I'll have an idea occasionally, but you know, generally like Jason Wilson's an idea machine. A lot of the freelancers we work with are idea machines. You know? So they're, they're, and, they're on the pulse yeah. of things. And, and, this, and, and even for traditional stuff like Bordeaux, we just had Christy Canterbury, you know, one of our um, contributors, she's you know, great. do pieces on, you know, I mean, it was a very weird on premier season and she did some great. She did, uh, I think we're publishing the second one the today. The Bordeaux Empremore? Yeah, yeah, the Bordeaux Empremore. It's, it's the only Empremore Bordeaux. I don't know. Uh, like, I'm, like I'm, I'm showing my ignorance. But look, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I'm I've an inspired never heard amateur. Of a Burgundy Empremore. I'm an inspired amateur. Like, you know, Christie's a master of wine, but I I, yeah. I, I agree. I think it's the only Empremore. Yeah. But, um, you know, it's an interesting way to tell a story about what's going on in Bordeaux. Um, you know, the pricing is dropping. And um, up and down. And, and like, down. you know, I don't want to give too much of the story away, but like, you know, they're merchants saying like, you know, these guys didn't drop the price. Like I haven't sold, I haven't sold any of it. Like no, no one's touching it. That's interesting. That, that, that implies a generational shift. Um, do you know, I would hope you do. Do you You'll be shocked what I do not know. Do you know analytics? Do you know what stories and topics to date that your readers are going towards? Wouldn't that help? That I do. going totally commercial. Oh, these guys love the Burgundy story. More Burgundy, more. It's nice to be validated, but do you know where people's oh, yeah. eyeballs are going? Absolutely. Um, no, can, unfortunately, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> can you be general with some insight? It's really a mix. Um, some really ambitious narrative stuff has done really well. Um, some stuff uh, about bourbon has done really well. Um, it's, I, I mean, I, I've been in bourbon. You said well, we we have an outstanding. Well, I'll, I'll talk to you about spirits. Well, I just want to say, like, we have an outstanding whiskey writer, yeah, Susanna we'll Discovery Barton, um, and she's great. And you know, one of her pieces, a lot of her stuff does well, but that did really well. But I mean, I, I mean, I'm not trying to be coy here, although I don't want to give you the top ten list. Um, I've been in media for a long time. You know, like I was, as you mentioned, acting editor in chief of Inc. Like I, we were, we paid very close attention to web traffic and like, you know, there can be a headline that you look at and you're like, this is going to do well. And then there's going to be the thing that will, no matter how much experience you have, the much, how much, how much data you have is going to surprise you. And we've had both and we've barely been going, you know? So when you say something like bourbon, which is a segue for me to, you know, your coverage on spirits. My guess, and I could be wrong, is that bourbon came on the scene to a little younger audience. Although I know a bunch of older guys who, you know, collect it and drink and obsess over certain things. And we talked about demographics earlier. Does the do the analytics give you insight to demographics? I mean, is it a 
legal legal drinking age to 49, you know. The, the, that gets to a level of detail that I, I mean, don't are, you, are, say. are you hitting the audiences you set out to? Yes. That's, that's yeah, a, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You're not like, oh, shit, you know, this is older than we thought or, you know, why mm, aren't no, middle aged no. people? I mean, and, and you know, th- that's th- content, th- th- right? there, there is a broad, you know, th- there's a broad range of stuff. I mean, I'm in my role. I look much more deeply at like what's resonating and what's not. And, um, you know, like doing basic blocking and tackling. This is going to be really boring for the wine audience because now we're talking about media mechanics, like, you know, know, like headlines eh, to use. And, we have a savvy audience. And, uh, I hope so. But I mean, like, like I'm in media and I can get, I can get, you know, I, I try not to go too deep into the plumbing on stuff like this. Um, you know, bourbon, uh, it's funny. I mean, I think it does skew to, I mean, this is me guessing. There is sort of a younger agro guy demographic that, that goes for it. Um, but I mean, the good stuff is really expensive, whether it's real or not, which is a whole other story, which is like the wine thing. It got expensive. You used to be able to buy two, three bottles of bourbon for the same price as a single malt scotch. I now remember, it's like in the same ball game. Let, let, let another grandpa story, but like it's at some point in the first uh, decade of the century and I go into Uva Wines <laughs> to get gifts for my family as I do. And my brother likes bourbon and there's a bottle of Pappy on the shelf and I'm looking, I'm like, I don't know. It's eighty dollars. Oh, you dummy! Yeah, yeah well, I, and and by the way, they had cases in the basement that I didn't know about. Yeah, I, I kind of fucked that one up. Sorry, Neil. But that's the burgundy was accessible and sure. cheaper. Well, you know, I, I we mean, all. yeah, but I mean, like now we're talking. I mean, like you know, Pappy is thirty x from that. Uh, yeah, and I mean, like, I think you would always understand that. Yeah, I mean, for whatever reason, there's not a lot of it. Yeah, and not all of it's real. So tell me about you cover spirits. You felt yeah. that within your audience, spirits was important to cover. Why? And Absolutely. tell me what you're doing with it. I mean, we, uh, I'm not trying to be coy here, but Susanna Skyver Martin, our outstanding uh, whiskey editor, comes to me with story ideas. And 99 times out of 100 of them, I say, that's amazing. Please write it. Like, so she's, she drives the bus. Right. So her, because she, she knows this, she knows this a lot better than I do. Right. Um, I'm not going to ask you if the analytics validate that, so we're going to move on. Um, Because, you know, maybe that's a criteria you should look at. Um, Noted. Is there anywhere else to go, like Saki, or or it's all built into... I I mean... Like, there's the the question is, what's next for the wine review? What's next? It's not even a year old, but from what you... We're like like three months. I'm saying, but from what you know already, you know, we don't need to do this, we should do that. I mean, we will see. I mean, I'm I'm happy experimenting. Um, You know, wine is... As you should. Wine is going to be the focus, but I mean, you know... There is some appetite for spirits. Um, you know, we're gonna we're, we're gonna we're gonna play without a bit. I'm sure. So you've been traveling a little. Yes. The question, two questions. You know, let's talk about your travel. But do your people travel when they can? Whether it's a junket or they're somewhere and they'll pop down to Champagne. Do the writers get on the ground a lot? Yes. Um, actually, kind of to a terrifying degree, if I think <laughs> about it. Well, because like I've been to. Since I started the New Wine Review, I've been to Piemonte, Oregon, and I just came back from the Northern Rhone. Uh, if I sound weird, people, it's because I'm still super jet lagged. I'm sorry. Um, uh, we've had someone go to Champagne. Jason has been to Spain. He was just in uh, Italy. Um, I am almost certainly, because I'm jet lagged, forgetting another place that he went to. I'm sorry. I'm just like, you know, half out of my mind here. Um, we, uh, we we do get around, and we, we have someone so in California. Very and we have someone in California. First-hand experiential tasting the wines, talking yeah. to the winemakers. I mean, that, that that's tell, obviously tell very me. Important. Let's just focus on you. Um, Why did you go to Oregon? Was there a specific task? You know, smaller, natural, different region, like the Nate Ready I type wines. I'm really fascinated with what's going on in Oregon right now. Um, for a lot of reasons, um, for the comeback from the fires, for the absolute excellence of the wines, the whites in particular, um, don't get all I, the attention. I don't want to say too much more than that. Cause I got a bunch of articles I got to write about okay. this, but I mean, th- th- that's, they'll, good. They'll be that's a good teaser. Yeah. What about you and I talked off air that we're both huge fans of the Rhone. Oh, let's go. Me, uh, the Northern, Northern Rhone, Rhone, Northern Rhone, Northern Rhone. Um, 
how the trip come about? Is it a, a mixture of this is what I'm doing for a living and I love these wines, so let's go there? Or was there a specific task? Um, th there was a specific task in that we hadn't done very much on the Northern Rhone yet. And um, I make um, many enormous sacrifices for this publication. And <laughs> yes, going to the do. Northern Rhone to visit with, you know, Pierre-Marie Klopp and Jean Ganon and uh, Emmanuel Versailles and Mathieu Barre, and um, I'm probably mispronouncing some of these names because I'm terrible, and Mikael Borg and uh, Agnes LeVay, and I'm forgetting at least one other person, and Jean-Michel <laughs> Stéphane. Did you do Shav or no? Uh, we did not get in Shav. Okay. I mean, I mean, okay. we, 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 had, we had a certain amount of time and like, it was a function of, um, I mean, we just couldn't fit everything in on day yeah, one. I mean, you mentioned I mean, all well, on day one, between 12 and 7 PM, we did Mathieu Barre, Mikael Borg, Shav, I'm sorry, Klopp, and then Jean Ganon. I mean, that was quite a freaking day. And by the way, going from Klopp to Ganon, um, just super eye-opening experience in Difference, difference. Um, you know, different terroirs, um, different ways of handling the terroir, um, but just absolutely benchmark expressions of Syrah. And uh, I mentioned this in that, like, I did a quick piece that just went up. Uh, I think yesterday. I, I'm jet lagged, so I don't know what day it is. Um, where I just did like ten or eleven quick impressions, and um, you know, we tasted with Pierre Marie Klopp um, the barrel components of the different vineyards that they're blending for the twenty two which was just a, just a amazing, uh, lesson in both the expressions of ter different terroir and Cornas, you know, which is kind of a tough appellation, but also just the skill of a blender and like what, what, what that gets honed into. Um, and then, then, then you, then you go to Ganon and you have just this incredibly pure, elegant, um, expression of Syrah grown on the slopes, magical wines. Okay, Ganon is one of my all time, all times. Like I was like, I felt like a 18 year old, like, you know, music nerd meeting, you know, like Thurston Moore, or right, the right. guys in Black Flag or, you know, something. Henry Rollins. Or something. Yeah, yeah. More Greg Ginn before we knew yeah, what a bad yeah, yeah, guy yeah. Greg Ginn was. Um, but that's yeah. a whole other story. Um, uh, you know, just, just spectacular. Um, and uh, obviously, it's a delight to go out to the restaurants and see benchmark Syrah wines on, on the list for shockingly little money in the grand scheme. Yeah, I know. That's I, I kind of want to go back tomorrow. Like, there's, I, I left a lot. Of, I've never made the trip, and I'm, I I'm recommend ready to it. Really. Very humble, very humble vineyard. Um, sorry, very humble villages. Uh, very humble vineyard. Um, well, we talked about that. It's very rural. These guys, yeah. in reality, are farmers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. Gonan is a little more of a sophisticate, but he spends most of his time there. That's what he does. Uh, I mean, like yeah. he, he does he does appointments which are not easy to come by. Um, in excuse me, in the early evening because I mean he's in the vineyard, right? As he should be. Right. Um, and I mean these are all small operations. Uh, so you did a small piece on it. More to come. On more to the come. Yeah, yeah, I've okay. got I've got to find the time to do the bigger piece okay. as well as all the other stuff that I haven't gotten to writing yet. John, there's a million other things to talk about, but That's we right, got to yeah. sort of wrap it up and come to the end. But a couple of things I want to do. I want to subject you to our wine list. Please. And I want to talk a little more about this wine. And without me overly explaining it, you did exactly what you should, which is to bring a wine representative of your taste, what the magazine's about, who's making it. And we'll talk about that a little. So that's a nice thing. Um, plus, I got to schnur our free taste of wine. Too. Uh, always happy to. <laughs> All right. So let's do uh, the wine list the sure. wine list is a feature on the grape nation we've done about 300 times we've asked everybody the <laughs> same five questions nothing has changed we have a database of the greatest people telling us about their wine preferences and then you have me showing up too right to blow the whole thing totally sorry about that folks it ends tonight um so be spontaneous don't dwell on answers um i post these so uh, I think discovery is a great thing about media, podcasting, your site. That's why people go to it. Um, I think people are interested in, you know, what you're thinking. So the first question is, what are you drinking now? What's in your fridge? Are you, I wouldn't say stuck, but are you stuck tasting wines for a story or the magazine? Do the seasonal changes push you from dark reds to, may I say, rosé? What, what are you drinking now? 
there are wines that I drink year round. Um, I tend to drink more red, although my wife is, I'm sorry, my wife is primarily a white burgundy fan. So there's a fair amount of white burgundy. She's so, fancy. Uh, yeah. She, she has, she has very good taste. Um, uh, unfortunately for in, in the wine. No, I mean, <laughs> um, I'm always happy to drink white burgundy with you, baby. Um, so year round white burgundy, Northern Rhone reds, um, burgundy, uh, red burgundy, um, and very old California cab, like generally before 1990. I always have an appetite for that, cl the classically styled stuff. What am I drinking now? Um, I am working, I'm, I tend to come back from a place and I think about those wines for a good long while. I was in Piemonte in February, so I was um, drinking a fair amount of that stuff. Uh, I love Barolo and Barbaresco. I, Barolo in particular, like it's between the first of November and springtime. I some I lose the taste for it when it gets hot. Um, I'm going to be drinking a lot of Northern Rhone for the next week. And Would I, you list a couple of Barolos that you know you love or have always kind of pulled? Yes. Uh, anytime. Uh, well, I mean, there's the obvious stuff. Bartolo Mascarello, pretty much any vintage. I had a 2018, which is a vintage I do not touch, that a guy in Piemonte uh, at uh, La Cochinella, and I think Sarah Lunger like, insisted I drink, and he was right. Through an indicator, it was beautiful. 2018, like, that, yeah. that's a year that's too fat. Yeah. It was it was beautiful. Um, my other favorite, I mean, these are fairly obvious. Um, I love Flavio Rodolo. I probably like his Nebbiolo better. Wait, so I'm not familiar. Flavio? Flavio Rodolo. R-O-D-D-O-L-O. -E -O -O. I managed to visit Flavio with him. Flavio Rodolo. Um, I don't know if anyone's Jean, ever Jean de Moore brings him into the U.S. There's like, it's sort of being discovered now, ultra traditional, small production. Um, we just blew it. He grew up, uh, well, I mean, people should know about him. He's well into his seventies. He's one of the last of that generation. It's like him and Akamaso and there's someone else who I'm forgetting. Um, those are good ones. Yeah. They're, they're very intense, very stern and uncompromising. Um, so you stop drinking Barolo come spring, which is pretty now. much. Yeah. I mean, if, if, you, if you had a Giacomo Conterno, I'd probably like, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd hurt Anytime. myself, and hurt myself. So what does the spring bring? The spring the white brings burgundies. me back to, yeah, the white burgundies, uh, big producers, uh, I mean, of the non, like La Fleuve, duh, uh, Fiché, love Fiché, love, love, love that reductive style. Um, I should have taken a look at my notes. I had a very eye-opening experience at the Polaner tasting with a, a producer that I liked, but didn't know I loved. And of course, now I can't remember who they are. So um, if you it. remember, text me. Cause I by will. the time I post I will it, actually, yeah, I'll I just got to go back. I got to go back and look at my notes. Um, and, uh, this weekend, um, uh, I'm going to go back and taste Emmanuel Versailles, who we also visited with right. in, um, Cornas, uh, her signature cuvee, which was one of the eye-opening wines of the of the trip. Just um, they, they've got a fantastic plot in uh, uh, the La Genelle uh, vineyard, like just you know that that's been in the family, and it's just spectacular. Um, I didn't I didn't know much about her, and um, I want to open up a old bottle of um, Levé Cote Roti Chavaroche, uh, and there's probably one or two other things I'm forgetting about. God, I probably have six bottles of Levé that I've never opened and never. How old tasted. are they? How old are they? We're from three to ten years old. I would wait on still. All. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, talk to me about offline about the ten year old ones because Agnes gave us her list of the stuff that's drinking a little younger. Okay. Uh, yeah. Did I answer uh, that question? If I'm kind of yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, very well. Um, any? The answer was somewhat traditional. Not. I'm not saying that you know being negative. Any outliers? Like, is there like South African Shenans you're trying, or you never get to the Loire as much? I mean, I'm really it, glad you brought that up. Um, there is a new generation in South Africa and in, in Australia, in particular, that I find really fascinating. Um, they're. I mean, they're less new than they were ten years ago. But this is Luke Lambert, um, my departed friend, Taris Okada of Okada Barrels, rest his soul, a lovely human. Um, uh, Gary Mills of Jamsheed, which I don't even know if is imported anymore. Um, these are people who are doing Shiraz as Syrah and not as Shiraz. And That's when it's, interesting. well, when it's done right, like Luke Lambert's expression, his Shiraz, I, they're just beautiful. Like they're super lifted, a lot of violets and Gary Mills at Jamsheed, like there's this really powerful streak of iron running through it that I just, I just can't fucking get it. All of. the characteristics of good Syrah, Northern yeah, Rome. I mean, Meaty, some, some violet, exactly. Um, it, it's, mineral, it's a little more heightened. Iron. It's a little more heightened, but I mean like, yeah, the violets that Luke Lambert gets is really something like you may not know it's from Australia and South Africa, like, uh, Lismore, Old Vine Shannon from Al Height, uh, 
and Milano does some really nice stuff. Their mm. top cuvées are a little pricey, but they, yeah. they deliver. Good ones. All right, we're going to move to the next question. By far the goofiest of them all and the shortest. Your favorite wine and food pairing. Not what you think is a good wine and food. Not what we think. What do you like? Obviously, you don't eat it that often. But what's the ooh-ah? What works? In the summertime, cider and fried chicken. Cider and fried chicken. Cider and fried chicken. A yeah. first. Is a, this sparkling like, cider? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, so this is so, the champagne and fried chicken answer, but with cider. I like cider better. There was... Why? I, I need to. I need to, I, I need to get some. As, you know, Paul Stanley of the Horrible Band Kiss once said... <laughs> I need to get something off my chest. There is um, a Austrian cool. producer of, uh, yeah, it's one of his few. Um, there's the Austrian producer. No, of, I meant that you quoted him, not the quote. <laughs> I'm impressed with that. Uh, Stanley Eisen. Sitting here for an hour and a half and you're quoting Paul Stanley. Nice Jewish boy. Folks, the interview's over. That's totally fair. I would not I would not argue with that. There was a there is a producer of Eau de Vie and Brandy in Austria, Reiset Bauer, who were doing what they called, I think, Apfelwein. It was a bone dry cider which they stopped making mm. and they stopped making it i think two years ago and i've been going around literally the country trying to find the, the bottles of it that i can i think i found the last four and um that particularly with the that fried, with chicken? fried chicken yeah and i mean i'll i'll probably level up and do more um you know french stuff the obvious bordelais and there, there's the the really expensive one that people are excited about le souffle the, the sophia i'm met I'm messing it up. My French is terrible. I'm jet lag. Shoot me, people. Sorry. Right. But yeah, um, but that, that, sparkling that, cider, dry that, cider, that's and fried a chicken. first on the Grape Nation, yeah. and I appreciate I will go that, to the, and I think it works. I will go to the mat on this one. Okay. All right. This question, I'm asking you not to rank or these are your favorites. I just want you to spew out a few wine restaurant and or bars that do what you and I have been talking about. Good selection, a selection that's important to us, good vibe, good atmosphere. Some of them are just wine bars, some are wine and food. Um, you know, intelligent much, people. How so much here's time the you got? Well, no, no, give me two or three. <laughs> so here's the point. The two or three that you mentioned are not one and two. They're just some thoughts. And if you bump into Pascaline LaPeltier and she says, how come you didn't mention me? That's not what it was about. Well, it's just... I mean, Chambers is pretty good. Uh, I'm uh, full disclosure. My wife and I are investors in Four Horsemen. I would so say them Four anyway. Four Horsemen shows off up the table, but off Four the table. Horsemen, shows I'm telling there. you, shows up as much or more than anyone. If well, I told we, you, we, I did, we are in Williamsburg right now, so you know. I mean, if I told you that you know I've done 300 of these, and that probably Four Horsemen has the highest percentage of recos. I will for, for a reason. Okay. So I'm just so let, let, let me get, let me go somewhere different. Um, I'm going to go you, to two places. Because you're impressed, you're comfortable, they're doing a good job. That's uh, all. Well, I, I'm, I'm sort of choosing more places that are a little less known, but there's- That's what I want. Gems are, um, Harry's of Hanover Square, the, the steakhouse the way downtown. famous wine guy. He had a yeah. store and a big Which, cellar. Uh, yeah. And um, actually, uh, Eli's Table on the Upper East Side. Unbelievable. Uh, Eli Tebow, was on the show. Yeah. Well, I, I, got, I saw- He, I got he ages his one. own meat. Uh, I, I would not mess with that guy, but um, they, they've got a, a wine guy named Tebow there who's fantastic. I love and Tebow. the list is like spectacular and well priced. And um, I kind of don't want to let the secret out, but people need to know about that. I think a lot of people have sort of Instagrammed it and all that. And I think As Tebow's active. Uh, Eli took me down to the wine cellar. I like, cannot confirm or deny if I've been down in the wine cellar, but I hear it's completely insane. And there's well, like not, cases of Bizot. Well, it's and, not fancy or organized. I go, Eli, like, where's all the Romani Conti? He goes, oh, you want to see that? So he brings me in some corner with like crooked boxes and all. He goes, I don't drink as that. Long, as, lo as long as it's climate controlled. Yeah, I mean, like he should, so those, he should sell it and get pay the mortgage for the next two, three years. Those are great recos, and those are representative of probably places that are – Somewhat amazing, but not everybody knows about. It. All right, we're going to move to the fourth question. Good job on that last one. I feel bad that I only named places in New York, but uh, I actually I'll throw a third one in Vaunt in Paris, where I just was. Um, Marco Pelletier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The best. Um, it's, He's it's, been on it's, the show. It's a terrifying wine list. Although apparently they they had some uh, 
they had some like Nazi bottles there. Um, there was a bit of a stir Did he about get this. Crap for that or something? Yeah, and they disappeared from the list. Nazi yeah. bottles. Yeah, like li- li- yeah, it's, funny. yeah. Um, it, it's it was written about in the French. <laughs> from Adolf on the Hitler's movie. cellar. Yeah, it's not I, a good uh, thing. Right? I'm not sure I'm going to be drinking that. Um, all right, fourth question, and and just hear me out on this. Favorite all time wine. The original question was, John, what's the most expensive rare wine you ever drank? Great question for Aldo Soma Libernadine. I don't care about that anymore. You may have answered this question earlier. What's that wine that had the most influence on you that, you know, was mind changing, um, awakening, important to you? Well, what did you mention or the stag's leap from your dad? That, 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 that kind of fits that, that in the, cat. the door. Um, probably the first time I tasted Foyard, um, you know, when I was, you know, in my early 30s, uh, you know, and uh, you have a wine that is both joyful and immediately approachable that you can pour for anybody, you know, from a teenager to your great grandma, and they're going to like it, but it's also very profound. Um, and um, just on the other end, uh, you know, during COVID, my wife and I were opening the good bottles because, you know, we all could very well die the next day or lose <laughs> our sense of taste and smell forever, which is, well, it's not the same thing. Uh, and we opened a 06 Alamand Chaillot Cornas, which uh, that was that was pretty funky benchmark. Yeah. Was 06, I don't know, vintage. Was 06 was a, a, I think it's considered a good year. I'm not, I'm not like a Like great makers in an okay vintage make yeah. great wines. I think, but I think was that a good vintage too? I think it's considered a good year. And like, okay. I've, I've had good luck with, um, I've had good luck with uh, Northern Run. I, I don't know what the vintage charts say and I tend to disagree with them. All right. Um, good ones. Here's the last question. And you should be capable of answering this. Although whoever you give me way too much credit, I do because yeah, I'm going to make a bad comparison. Although the guy who edits Vine Pair probably would do a better job at this because he f- spends more time on it. But think about this, okay? <laughs> Recommend to me the best wine around fifteen, twenty, twenty-two bucks retail, a red and a white. You can go category like Muscadet. Oh, the you right bastard! Pro- Why don't you take it away from me? Well, no, you could you could use that. Um, but, you know, I always say this. My kids are in their late 20s. They can't show up at a party with a $50 bottle of no. wine. But they're too cool to show up with crappy, you know, supermarket wine. So what's the, you know, Beaujolais used to be the answer. Yeah, yeah, but it I mean, ain't 22 see, bucks that, that's anymore. Like, um, so I am pretty, I haven't tasted in a while. And I'm going to mispronounce it. But I'm pretty confident that Domaine des Anes, which is a Corbiere that was thirteen ninety nine um at uh uva back in the day it's probably 18.99 now that's the red that is the red yes um what's the grape uh that's a really good question that's, okay that is such a good question so Sam, here's I commend what I, you on that question no 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 here's what it's okay here remember i know less than you do um, you'd be shocked brother you have to text me Mm-hmm. You got to look up the spelling. I'll figure will, out yeah. all the great um, and everything. I'm but apologizing. I want to Don't I'm apologizing in advance for the You've mispronunciation. You've experienced the wine. You understand it's good. It's a value. It still hits the price range. That I answers, should have thought about we'll, this question. We'll, no, we'll get the I get deets. asked it a lot. We'll get the deets later. I'm also, by the way, I'm still thinking in the background about it. All right. So I'll take one red is fine. Mm-hmm. Um, give me white. Well, you kind of took Muscadet off the okay. table, which so is we're, I'm heartbreaking. Gonna, I'm going to list that. Does anything else come to well, mind? Well, that, 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 that's what I'm cogitating And if now. you're not, if uh, you can't think of something, fine. But. Uh, well, give me, uh, you're going to give me 30 seconds and you're going to edit out this pause I know. Maybe you can like tell a little no, story. No, no, no. You're going to think about it while we go. Mentally go around the world. We're going to go to the uh, next topic while sure. you're thinking about that. So, I will say, actually, I will say this. Um, I think the pricing would work out if you can find it, which makes me a terrible person. But um, when we were in the Northern Rhone, uh, Jean-Francois Malser of uh, Domaine Lizerand, been producing about 10 so years. So spell Lizerand for me. L apostrophe I-S-E-R-A-N-D. Lizerand. Uh, he poured a pet nat. I am not a pet nat guy. Um, 11% alcohol. Um, I hope it's imported. Uh, I would buy this by the container load full, even though there's probably not a container load of it, and bathe in it all summer. 
Okay. Yeah. And, and I think, and I think it fits, I think it's under 20 bucks. At least that's a good friend. one. You know what? I started at 15 to 20. I stretched it to 22. I think it's yeah. eventually go to under 30. Uh, if, if it's under 30, then you can start getting into Sandland's red table wine. I think if you buy it on release, which You're is right. great. Um, and Tegan's probably the one on the show. I know the white list. Uh, I've, Sandland's is super inspiring to me. Spectacular stuff. I know. And they've, they don't have to do this, but they've kept their pricing constant. And that's, Pretty commendable. It's a great value, and there, there's no way their costs. This is a guy who's the, same. the best. Yeah, and th- th- there's no way. Conviction, experience, knowledge, unbelievable. I just like driving around California, finding those old. I'd crazy give him venues. a big hug, but I don't know if I can get my arms around. Him. Ooh, uh, no, he he's Stretch. the best. Um, all right, so good job. Like I said, I'm gonna post those. Um, and I think didn't you used to ask like the like the white whale bottle, the one that you've never found? No. Oh, that's too bad. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. So we're going to move to the final segment, then I'm throwing you out of here. We do the weekly wine sip. Every week we taste a different wine on air. The idea is, you know, I have a lot of winemakers. Let's taste their wines. I have a lot of Psalms. I didn't you know, mention this, but I'm not a winemaker. I'm sorry. No, I know. But you are a wine publication. That was a joke, people. That I was know. a joke. I know. Um, and I want you to tell me about the wine that you brought in. Um, you just handed it over to me. So this is... Ah, oops. Uh, this was mentioned in um, one of the new wine review pieces by Jason Jacobite, um, which was, you know, single vineyard expressions of Burgundy that won't break the bank. Uh, this is Antoine Leonhardt. He is brought in by Polliner. Spell um, his last name. I should have... L-I-E-N-H-A-R-D-T. The, the Leonhardt. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, um, so he works out of Comblanchien, which is kind of an outlier village that I, I'm hopefully pronouncing correctly. Uh, he's great. Um, he's doing, I believe, mostly carbonic stuff, super joyful and open expressions. Um, uh, you can taste the terroir in each of his individual bottlings. So th- these are... It's a Cotonou village. Uh, and this is the Le Pointe à Bois 2020. Um, I bought a bunch of these. So What's Le Pointe à Bois? The uh, vineyard or just the name of the that wine? That is, I believe it's the Lou. It's a, it's, it's, I believe that's a vineyard, yeah. Okay. It's, it's a vineyard because he, he does single vineyard expressions. Um, so here it's, it's. I love this. And we're getting to a season where this is the kind of burgundy that you want to drink or at least you want to start with. It's very open. It's very joyful. It is everything. It ticks all the boxes of, of um, burgundy. Um, and it's not super thinky. Like with Beaujolais, it like it, it's a wine that will make everyone happy. So there's good fruit. I'm gonna do a little swig. Well, let's let me do my thing. So color wise, mm. it's you know good typical burgundy ish. You know, not dark, not light. A little bit of haze in there. I mean, he works pretty. A little naturally. bit of haze, which I'm okay with. Totally okay with. Let's go nose. Give me your nose descriptors. I'm getting some. You any good at this crap? Uh, one would think, you know. I'm getting flowers. I'm getting sweeter purple fruits, um, like kind of a crunch of minerality too, like something a little rocky. What are you getting? Similar. Get the- <laughs> Come on. I get the minerality. Yeah, the minerality pretty much jumps, jumps out of I don't know purple you. fruits. Is that like plums and uh, I guess it, it, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, uh, um, like I said, jet lagged. It, it's, uh, it's blue fruits. It's not blue black fruits. and it's not red. Okay. Yeah. It's definitely not, it's definitely not black and it's, it's not – there's Super definitely high toned. There's a floral component mm-hmm. somewhere there. All right, now mouthfeel. It's kind of a medium. It's not thin. It's not unctuous. It's got a nice. Yeah, it, it's 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 satisfyingly full on the palate for it burgundy. It is medium, medium plus. Yeah. Now that I it's, taste it's it, it's not um, it's not like insanely silky, like like the incredibly right. refined expressions. But that's fine. You know, I mean, this is a wine that's fifty bucks. Now palate descriptors. Do they replicate? the nose are we getting mineral floral blue fruit or do other things pop in not the most scientific thing i can say but grapey um like it it, it you know i get i get kind of a so uh, like i a, use a, like grapey a darker, embarrassingly a darker, darker purple grape thing happening um, it is it is a very and- good crunch of minerality at the end some acidity around it this is a little um, it, it, it's open. Um, I, I wonder if I've let it go a little too long. This I is don't a think so. Cause you were concerned when you first opened it and tasted it. What'd you say mm. when you first opened it? I mean, it? like it's, it's evolving from, from where it was. Um, it hasn't finished evolving to where it's going to go. I think, um, it's also a question of like 
how far carbonic burgundy evolves. It's definitely a much longer conversation. You definitely know it's a carbonic wine yeah, yeah. when you taste it. What's the vintage? This is 20. Okay. Yeah. I, uh, I buy this every year. I think I screwed up this year because um, the word's getting out on this guy and they're disappearing from the market pretty quickly. So Although the, the pricing has not gone crazy the way it has for other micro negociants like Les Oreilles or Chanterive, um, you know, yeah. things like that. Um, I just saw Leon and Sons got a big drop of Chanterive, so he puts it Ooh. on his Instagram. Mm, it's like you couldn't sell it without putting it's it on gone. Instagram. Yeah, that, yeah. That, that, that's gone. I'm sorry to say. But, but he's um, a good guy, Chris. Um, I, uh, I I almost brought uh, Chanterive, but I think this tells a more interesting story. So Tomiko and Guillaume oh, yeah, on the show. Fantastic. We've had everybody on. I know, man. You do a good job. Um, I mean, aside from having me on, you do a good job. No, 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 no. All right. So let me do a quick wrap up. We're done with the weekly wine sip, and then I want to get some information so people can go where mm -hmm. we've been talking about. So if you have a question, suggestion, wine happening, or event, hit me up at sam at thegrapenation.com. That's sam at thegrapenation.com. Or info at the new wine, uh, info at new wine We're going to get to that. We calm down? <laughs> Subscribe to the Grape Nation podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever you get your pods. If you like the show, leave us a nice review. Um, follow us on Instagram at sbenruby on Twitter or X at benruby. I know those are two different things, but you can reach us with the hashtag the Grape Nation. Um, we are on Facebook at the Grape Nation. As I mentioned, we'll post John's wine list, all those great answers, and I will give you the specific information on our weekly wine sip um, on our social media sites. All right, John, this is go time here. Where and how do we find the wine review? The, the site, new wine review. The new, <laughs> keep doing that. The, I suck at this. The new wine review. Let's be transparent about everything. Where do we find it? There's a fee, you know, if you want to talk about that subscriber yes. and all that, go ahead. We are a subscription publication. Um, uh, you can go to the website to get the details, newwinereview.com. That price gets you access, full access to the site, full access to the insight scores and the metrics on top of that that we talked about, and full access to our private Slack community where a bunch of lunatics about wine Talk about wine all day. So I didn't get into that. And, you know, in doing research, I noticed that. Just talk to me a little about that. Are those people beyond the core of writers you talked about or it's their stuff? Oh, um, it, it's, uh, it's, stuff. it's subscribers. It's some, um, you let it's, them. It's, um, it's some friends of the new wine review who, um, who know quite a bit about wine and, and it's the staff. So I'm not a big Substack guy. Is it almost stack. like, um, I'm sorry, Slack, not Substack. Sub Slack? No, Slack. 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 Not Substack. Slack. Slack is a, it, most people listening will know what Slack is. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's, it's a tool. It's an internal uh, messaging tool that's very full featured. Um, it's like Discord. Um, it's like, it, it's like a better version of AOL Instant Messenger, if y'all right. remember that. Okay. So there's more and different content on Slack. Which uh, is yeah, part it's, it's, of it's it's the ongoing it's the ongoing conversation. The ongoing conversation, like you know, you post questions, you get answers. We talk about the weird shit we're doing, uh, the weird stuff we're drinking, where we're going, where you're going. If you want advice on that, all that stuff. All right, so that's how you get to the new wine review. If we want to follow on social, where are you know just new obvious. new wine review on Instagram, new wine review on LinkedIn, new wine review on Facebook. Okay, uh, I don't believe we're on Twitter or X or whatever they call it this week. You are. What? You are. I, we are? Yeah. yeah. Um, I check. Not super active. Yeah. Yeah. Not a lot of going on there, but that's a good place to be. Um, what about you? Are you active personally on social media for the cause of the I new have wine been review? very bad about being active on social media, but that's changing, Sam. So uh, I am at, uh, at John Fine on Instagram. That's There's no H in John, so that's J-O-N-F like Frank, I and like Nancy do you view that as an opportunity to share experiences, but also promote um, the site, or you don't necessarily see it that way? I mean, it's, it's all of the above. Uh, I've uh, I was very active on Twitter when it came out. Um, I got years ago. Yeah, yeah, um, a long time ago. Um, I got disenchanted with it. Uh, you know, probably around the presidential election of 2016 for some reason, um, and. Uh, um, I've, I've 
pulled back on social media somewhat, but um, I, by getting into wine, I've discovered a, and thinking about it now all day as my job and not just as something that I'm generally obsessed with. Right. Um, like, you know, there's just such a, a great conversation around wine going on on Instagram. Um, yeah. And it's, it's my fault that I've not been enough of a part of it. Well, it's never too late. It that's, is not too late. That's why. And I thank you for the kick in the pants. All right. I'll be uh, monitoring that. Please do. All right, John, we got to wrap it up. I want to thank our guest, John Fine. John Fine is the editor in chief of the new wine review. Um, we talked about how you can get to that and what's going on there. I want to thank our engineer, Armin, and everyone at the Heritage Radio Network. I'm Sam Ben Ruby, and you've been listening to. To the Grape Nation. The Grape Nation is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.